Sego Sewaguego and Watkwanu Radu to our very first show of FNTV 360. I'm one of your hosts, Regan Jacobs. And I'm Sergio Pavone. Uh, bienvenue et uh, bonjour. Uh, C'est notre première émission 360, alors j'espère que vous allez apprécier. And so lots going on today. Um, and uh, of course, we are covering uh, news from uh, local mm -hmm. and in the region and uh, also all the way up uh, through Indian country, if you will, um, from Ganawage to Ganasadage, Akusasne, all of our sister communities in the Confederacy. But it doesn't stop there. If we see something out towards Quebec City or even in the States that we feel um, is reflective of First Nations or Indigenous issues, we're going to cover it. So Yeah, definitely. I think uh, people have a tendency of always identifying, uh, you know, First Nation issues specifically only uh, directly directly linked to First Nations, mm -hmm. but First Nation issues cross the borders now. Uh, it, it touches everybody and it's important for everybody to know about it. So First Nation issues are also issues of the communities that are neighbors of First Nations. Yeah. One of the things that uh, we're doing here at FirstNationsDV.com is uh, this is the first official show that we've launched under our new brand, which uh, we officially uh, rebranded into actually um, in the spring of 2015. And it's taken us the summer and now into the fall to get going and here we are at the end of the year and we're launching our very first show and you were talking about the importance of this kind of media and this kind of presence in, in um, you know in the industry nowadays yeah well I think the, the stereotyping of First Nations has always uh, been one of the factors the linguistic factors also another one that has uh, built barriers between First Nations and non-natives mm -hmm. and uh, by creating this medium where we talk about what's going on in First Nations and we address it to not only the members of that community but also the neighbors mm -hmm. and vice versa we also cover issues that are being you know uh, going on outside of the territory uh, but have a direct impact on a community for example highway 30 issue here in Ganawage whatever is being decided in the MRC has a direct impact on Ganawage and what Ganawage does has certainly an impact on the neighboring community so that's this is the type of news that has to be developed. I think this is the type of communications that we need between mm -hmm. uh, both cultures so that we can better understand each other and get along. <laughs> yeah, get along is a key word there. Now, uh, for those of you who are wondering, of course, FirstNationsTV.com is an independent media. We are an indigenous media and we, you know, obviously our, our vision and our mission is to cover First Nations and indigenous issues in the country, but it doesn't stop there. We, we always say as a nation that we don't have borders so if we feel that something in the United States you know is reflective of some of the things that First Nations are going through across the country and even on an international level um, we're going to be discussing it here um, and as I just said we are independent so we're not uh, run by any government we're not subsidized we actually look for uh, companies or corporate sponsors so if you're interested in that uh, coming on board with us and this is a very important uh, time and and of course um, prestigious because we have a niche in our market mm -hmm. and we you know we're standing out among the crowd so to speak exactly I think uh, there's a lot to be proud of and I think our region uh, not only Ganawage but the neighboring uh, communities and the business uh, community has to be proud of that has to encourage it mm -hmm. you know they need to be behind this because this is you know, one tool amongst others, but an important tool that helps uh, create links that are very, very essential to uh, getting along and living common lives. Right. So, I mean, I agree. And I think that, you know, if you want more information, be sure to stop by our website, firstnationstv.com, and you'll find uh, more about us on there. And also uh, staying up to date on what's happening in and around our community and in our region. Uh, earlier, you mentioned uh, Highway 30. Mm -hmm. um, in recent uh, weeks, I would yeah. say, like within the last couple of days, there was a, a press release that was put out by the Mohawk Council of Ganawage with regards to Highway 30. That's here in Quebec. And um, they had felt that they, they wanted uh, or were demanding an immediate, immediate meeting with uh, Pierre. With, uh, uh, Mr. with Cuyard, Mr. Cuyard. Yes. Um, 
Philip, excuse me, in the aftermath of legislation, uh, Bill 85 that was introduced um, into the National Assembly regarding the economic development plans for Highway 30. Yes, well there's uh, certainly this is where we see where communications and understanding and perception is, is very important in uh, the uh, cross-cultural relations because, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure Council and the Grand Chief has a uh, legitimate right to say that they weren't consulted, but at the same time, uh, Mr. Uh, Pierre Moreau, which is the M&A of the Chattagui area and now Minister of Municipal Affairs, mm -hmm. said at the beginning of his mandate that this is what he wanted to do. He wanted to create, um, you know, uh, a law that would permit uh, facilitating economic development in the region, mm -hmm. well, spe specifically around Highway 30. Now, whether or not Council was invited to go there. We are not sure of that yet. We didn't get a chance to talk to anybody about that. Mm -hmm. We're certainly going to clear it up, but I think these are things that need to be cleared up and it helps uh, the viewers understand a little more, you know, what's going on. Right. I mean, and, you know, there's a history here and obviously, you know, they were demanding a meeting with uh, Mr. Culliard because they felt that this decision was made behind their backs. Yeah. And, you know, being a member of the Mohawk community here in Ganawage, I can understand the, you know, that feeling of, well, this is what, this is the deal that we have on the table with Quebec right. um, and, and Canada. And, you know, Highway 30 was allowed to advance because of a deal that the former Grand Chief had made uh, regarding Highway 30 lands in exchange for these lands. And it's, and it's interesting because a lot of people are saying, well, it's, it was land that we already owned, so we're exchanging it, but it was already land, it's already under the seigneurie land claim. Yeah, so exactly. I mean, I can understand the, yeah. the frustration. Oh, definitely. It's like they had a deal on giving back land that already owned and was recognized by the federal government as being owned by the Mohawks. Mm -hmm. So there's a high level of frustration and it's understandable. What's unfortunate is on the other side, perception is not like that. The non-natives do not perceive it that way because they don't understand that this land was previously and still is Mohawk mm -hmm. territory. And that municipalities come along and sue the government of Quebec uh, to avoid them uh, from transferring these lands so that they can have guarantees financial and developmental uh, type of guarantees for their e economic developments. Mm -hmm. And this is understanding that, it, you know, we can understand why there's frustration that's being built around this, but the fact of the matter is there was a lot of con consultation going on before and there was uh, positive um, reactions and then there was a change of governments uh, locally in the municipalities and there was a change of attitude. So, you know, there's a lot of things mixed in there and uh, it, it makes for a pretty explosive situation. I mean, it, it seems like it, it is a explosive at this point, um, simply because there was a lot of reaction and then you did have, um, you know, Mr. Moreau and Mr. Couillard making statements in the past few days saying that, well, the Mohawks needn't worry, we're going to get to the table, we have to have a meeting. But what's interesting was, previous to this announcement being made, you actually did a story yes. on the MRC and the change of uh, the prefect and th with the new prefect actually saying, well, we all have to get to the table. And so it seems like a little bit two-faced, you know, to say this in, in, in a comment to a local media, but knowing was this coming, were they aware of it? So when you say that we all need to get to the table as mayors of local surrounding communities, what were you saying exactly? It see, to me, it seemed a little sneaky because you had just literally done this story. Right. And so, in your opinion, you know, you've been around the political bloc, you're the former mayor of Chateauguay, you know a lot of the individuals that, uh, that were at that meeting that evening. What is your take on, on this? Well, my take on it is quite simple, is before uh, there was change, before 2009, uh, there was two years of discussions with the uh, Quebec government and officials. Uh, John Parizella was one of the uh, representatives of the Quebec government. They would come almost every month to sit at the MRC and to tell us what was going on because they would be sitting at a table with the Mohawks and then they mm -hmm. would come and meet us and tell us and then we would have uh, less meetings with the Mohawks but we would have communications uh, through the officials from the Quebec government and things were going you know, quite well. 
uh, when I left uh, in 2009. Since then, new uh, elements came into power. Uh, this lawsuit, because uh, they wanted to freeze everything, mm -hmm. there was change of power here in Ganawagi also. Right. Joe Norton came back um, into politics, and then you know there was a build up. There was this, uh, you know, uh, business uh, boycott that came out. It, it exasperated a little bit of the people. So this situation is, is quite um, complicated. At the same time, quite simple. The land belongs to the Mohawks. It was uh, agreed to uh, a transfer. Uh, then uh, municipalities opposed the transfer. Mm -hmm. And then the Mohawks ceased to, uh, you know, communicate with Quebec. Uh, and Quebec ceased also to communicate with the Mohawks, but at the same time kept talking to the municipalities, which is, you know, a no-no. You don't do that. You keep all parties around the table. And now when you feel like they're coming to a conclusion and they need the Mohawks to be included, now is when they start saying again, oh, you should come back to the table. Yeah. <laughs> when for the last year or so, they were negotiating at a table without the participation of mm -hmm. the Mohawks. So I understand the frustration, but... I don't think the strategy is to keep going along that frustration is to say, okay, you guys played your game, now we need to stop this playing around. Everybody mm -hmm. should sit around the same table. Let's settle this once and for all. And the first thing that should be understood, and the first thing that I think the municipalities, Quebec, Canada, and the Mohawks have to agree on, is does everybody around the table agree that this land does belong to the Mohawks? Mm -hmm. No well, complaints there then we can move forward. I mean, the mayor of Chateauguay, at least the, mayor, the, the current mayor, I, I remember being at that press conference uh, two years ago maybe when when they announced that they were going to file this lawsuit um, and that, you know, how they weren't uh, consulted. Um, in a recent, uh, in I think, statement that she had made regarding the Highway 30 issue, she does say, well, I understand why Ganawage needs to file, uh, you know, needs to move forward, needs to, you know, ha why they have concerns, but we were never consulted. And I just find it interesting that there does seem to be a lack of sincerity on her part, and, and, and you know, maybe it sounds biased of me to say this, but I don't feel that she's ever really made the effort to come to the table with Gunawage as the mayor of Shadigi the last couple of years. Um, there was there's a lot of approaches in the media that almost make it seem like she doesn't want to work with us because I haven't I don't ever I don't look at what people are saying. I'm looking at what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And if our neighbors really cared about our community and our economic prosperity, then where have they been? Yeah, it's it's a good uh, it's a good question because I believe, and maybe I'm wrong, but the information I've gathered is that there has been only one meeting. Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, when uh, Mike Delil was Grand Chief, and it was uh, just prior to the elections, and they were talking about this economic development, uh, you know, issue and making the law and so on and so forth, and it was called upon by uh, the uh, M&A of Chateauguay, Mr. Uh, Moreau. Since then, there has been no other meeting, mm -hmm. and you don't need you don't need the MNA to create meetings. Uh, I remember when I was mayor, I would have regular meetings with the, the Grand Chief, and I would come to the to the uh, table and talk to the um, the council, and we'd have regular exchanges. And I would be very uh, I would be in close contact also with uh, Te Watani uh, mm -hmm. economic development. So it, it all depends on what their priorities are, and I don't believe that. Other than this issue of land transfer, I don't believe that uh, the relationship is uh, something that is important on the agenda. I'm not saying it's not there. I just think it's not very important on the agenda of the right. mayor of Chattagui right now. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, that's um, that's something that is, is individual. Um, unfortunately, it has never came out as um, an electoral issue. And that's something that's important, I think you know, relationships with the Mohawks in every community of the MRC should be at the core of every election. Mm -hmm. People should talk about it. People should have a right, the citizens should have a right to vote for someone who is, uh, you know, has one or another philosophy in regards to First Nations, mm -hmm. uh, especially their relationship with the Mohawks, which has never been done. Right. I, I mean, and it's not even just, you know, the surrounding communities. We're, we're, we're talking specifically to our region um, and to our community. But if you look across the country right now, there there is this shift, you know, so to speak, an uprising with Indigenous people across Canada and the United States. 
and and we want to be you know heard and and also respected and for people to acknowledge that uh, we've been here, we are still here, even after all of the trepidation that we've suffered as nations. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it goes to speak to other nations out there who are dealing with their neighbors in the same, in these same instances, because land issues are not specific to us, you know what I mean? Like, it's happening across the country. And, and so is, you know, wanting of uh, for, you know, better First Nations education, uh, more funding, and, and and so, um, you know, when we look at what affects us locally, from here to Quebec City to out to Midwest and, you know, way out to BC, you're, you're seeing this trend. You had I Don't Know More last year that, that continues on. But it, it's just a reminder to Canada and all the provinces that there are treaties, there, there, are, there are items and, and things that are in place that should be respected. And when we look at Highway 30, it's not so much about what we're losing, it's about the things that we've lost mm -hmm. and how we continue to get this treatment that, oh, but it's okay, you know? And, and that's what I found was interesting when Joe Norton had, had uh, you know, said in, in his uh, podcast, but he also said it to uh, the, media, the media when he talked about Oka crisis and how have people not learned, you know, when it comes to the land issues? Like, that should have been a big example of what not to do. But here we are again, back looking at the same issue. If you honestly think that people in this community are going to just say, yes, take the land and do what you want for your communities and to further your economic development, it's a huge mistake. Yeah, and it's fun. You're, you're mentioning this, and it, it reminds me of the uh, evening that I covered the um, the transfer of powers at the MRC, and I was talking to a citizen there, and I said, you know, isn't it funny, uh, what in a sarcastic way, right. that you know we always hear these things like, oh, it's not against you know the First Nations, it's not against the Mohawks, mm -hmm. uh, we just need to settle our you know, our beef with the government, and then we can take care of your beef. Mm -hmm. But initially, the land transfer is between the Quebec government, the Mohawks, and the Canadian government, which mm -hmm. was settled. So let them settle that, and then you can, you know, why don't you take the second stand, and why don't you settle your issues after? Mm -hmm. This is something I think is changing right now. As you said, uh, now the society, uh, the mainstream populations are starting to be more and more informed thanks to this type of media which is mm -hmm. independent and we can get right to the source and give another perspective which is the real perspective, both right. sides of the story. People are understanding more and more what's really going on and they're saying, wait a minute. Because before, people, you know, like weren't in interested in First Nation issues. It wasn't part of the electoral campaigns. Mm -hmm. Now it's part of the electoral campaigns. Mm -hmm. That's a big, big thing. Yeah, it's a big change. Yeah, it's major. And it's interesting, we're not, you know, maybe uh, coming from, you know, my perspective as a First Nations uh, individual, but I also have, uh, you know, roots in, in that, are, that are also not First Nations or non-Indigenous, but you have no connection, like, you know, uh, hereditary-wise yeah. to the <laughs> community or even, we're like in, you know, we're adopting you in a thing. And so it's interesting because you can give another perspective without being personally invested so to speak in terms of your your hereditary so I think that's interesting um, but back to the highway 30 thing very quickly we did uh, manage to uh, possibly get a clip from uh, Grand Chief Joe Norton he did a podcast so let's mm -hmm. um, before we go to a commercial break we're gonna head over to uh, grab a quick excerpt from his podcast what I've seen today is a, is a total betrayal of the, and it's not, it shouldn't surprise me because that's been the story of, of our territory and our land for 400 years uh, plus since the arrival of the European. And it's no different than it was going way back then in terms of how they view the right to, the, to, to that land as opposed to the, to the real truth, which is we have, uh, that, that is our territory. And this bill is just a reflection of that mentality. 
uh, and the manner in which all of this was done is uh, is totally unacceptable. Uh, we have our ways of handling and dealing with it, uh, which will uh, come forth both on the ground as well as maybe from uh, from sort of a semi legal point of view in all of this. The federal government has a role to play in all of this, and they also must be taken to task. Um, we may have a new government in place. I don't know how up to scratch they will be. They still have the same uh, people in the forefront who are handling the claims policy. And this is not a claim. This is a grievance against, against Canada. It's not against Quebec, in a sense. It's against Canada and the French regime that was here at one time. So we need to uh, understand and then begin to uh, uh, group and begin to move to make movements that will be of benefit to us. It's blatant. It's in our face. It's like saying, you know, we're going to go ahead and we're going to develop the territory uh, around Highway 30 uh, without even mentioning the any kind of claims. Uh, you know, uh, they would use the word claim. Any kind of uh, recognition that you know this is our traditional territory as well as specific territory, uh, without mentioning Ganawage at all. It's just purely them, and we're not in, we're non-existent as far as they're concerned. So it creates a scenario where, uh, in in one in a one sense, that's 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 not good at all. It is uh, it is as far as I'm concerned, it's fraudulent. But on the other hand, it does make it very clear what we have to do now. We don't have to tiptoe around. We don't have to be nice to anybody anymore, or as nice as we've been, you know, in the last little while. The Rail Coal Fire Bistro is committed to offering top quality menu selections for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, including an after hours menu. The Rail Coal Fire Bistro, located on Highway 138 in Gunawage. And welcome back to the program. You are watching FNTV 360. I'm your host, Regan Jacobs, and joining me also our other host, Sergio Pavone. So we were just uh, wrapping up Highway 30, and we're going to get right to it, talking about Trudeau and his renewal of uh, relationship with First Nations people in this country. What did you think about his recent announcement at the AFN this week? Uh, I, you know, I think it's saying uh, we're going to be partners. Yeah. <laughs> Count on me. <laughs> well, it's something that we've heard many times before from different other governments, uh, mm -hmm. certainly not uh, from Harper's government, uh, but uh, from other governments. And, you know, at the beginning, you're, it gives you this sense of hope. Mm -hmm. uh, you really want to believe that this is true. I think he's going to do the right thing. He's going to move in the right direction. I believe the boat is very big. It's going to be hard right. to move everything in the direction he wishes, but already by by moving on the two percent and uh, unblocking that two percent cut to the uh, First Nation community, which was huge because you know leaders from across the country, um, you know, in Indigenous communities have been were calling on mm -hmm. the previous governments, of course, to um, look at First Nations funding and education. That you know, majority of communities were really underfunded. That it hadn't changed the formula in in years. And it's interesting that this announcement is made now at this time because I know that Gunawage just announced that we were having major funding issues and that we were going to be cutting uh, in our community. And I know that's that's pretty much a reflection of where oh, yeah. First Nations uh, communities are at in Canada. Yeah, so it's, it was dramatic when Harper cut that that budget. Uh, it's an actual budget that was cut two percent just to balance the federal budget, just for them to be able to pass the ramp and say that they have uh, uh, an equalized budget mm -hmm. so that they can go into an election. So this is again on, on the, the backs of First Nations and particularly First Nation kids going to school uh, or health care or so on. It's on their backs that he balanced his budget. Of course, yeah. he cut. Uh, well, there was so some criticism to that, right? They're yes, like at a time when Canada's pocketbook is, yeah, is hurting. Well. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Harper was uh, criticized on many, many things, and this is uh, a major issue. I think when Trudeau moved on that, I think that shows uh, a lot of. Uh, Good will, mm -hmm. uh, the missing and murdered women issue. That's Huge. major, yeah, very, and important. that was a really big uh, announcement that was made. Um 
just this past week too uh, with the three uh, women uh, cabinet ministers talking about the national inquiry how it's been uh, wanted and you know the one thing that I'm really impressed with with uh, Trudeau's government at this point is that they've actually had some follow-through and pretty quickly a national inquiry was called years ago and at the time you know Stephen Harper's government said well it's not it's not a priority for us and but you know obviously no First Nations issues were a priority for him and um, this is also leads to the fact that uh, Trudeau also announced that they were going to be looking at previous legislation that was passed under Harper's government regarding First Nations and some of the, those bills that went through if they were really a reflection of what was needed in the country at that time. But um, one of the things is this uh, Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould, uh, you know, she, she is one of the um, cabinet ministers that has indigenous roots. Mm -hmm. uh, they held this press conference this past week about the missing and murdered uh, women's issue. And they're going to be consulting the families and yep. seeing, you know, how do they feel that this type of inquiry can and should unfold. Yeah, it's it's particular to Trudeau, and I'm you know I'm always very skeptical with uh, political promises. I've been in politics long enough to know that you know there's things that you promise and then there's right. the deliverables. Mm -hmm. And if you can de deliver, then all the best. Uh, and Trudeau has so far done a lot in a very short time. And by rescinding these laws, or at least looking at the possibility of rescinding certain laws that are very negative to First Nations, and to do it, as you said, mm -hmm. you know, with the families, that, that's a first. In Canada's history, that we take a, a First Nation approach to solving a problem, which is a holistic approach. Let's include everybody involved right. and talk about something mm -hmm. that is essential to the, the modification of laws or uh, the encouragement of a new program or implementation of a law. This is a first in Canada, mm -hmm. to have an approach where you're holistic. A truly First Nation approach. Uh, it's, it's got nothing to do with our um, European, more business type or liberalistic, uh, liberalistic approach where it's top down all the time. Mm -hmm. This is fundamental and I think something we have to watch with the uh, Trudeau government. If, if he can manage to keep this up and he applies this to Canadian politics in general, this would be the greatest achievement of First Nations influence yeah. in cultural behavior in Canada. I wonder, you know, this this announcement actually was made in uh, Gatineau, Quebec. It was at a special assembly of the um, First Nations, uh, the AFN, the Assembly of First Nations. A thousand delegates, you know, descended uh, to Ottawa and um, from across the country, leaders from across the country. And I think that, you know, what I'm getting back from just um, social media and the impact that this has had across the country is that surprise that yes he said he was going to do it yes he called for a renewal a complete renewal of a relationship with uh, indigenous people in this country and and you know looking at a five point plan which i wanted to bring up he talked about the launch of uh, the missing and murdered women uh, lifting the two percent uh, funding gap in first nations education um, he wants to make uh, significant investments in um, in programming across the board, um, implementing all 94 recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, which I think That's is huge. huge. And uh, repeal all legislation, like I had talked about early, earlier, unilaterally imposed on Indigenous people by the former federal government, which I think is great because some of those uh, you know, legislations at the time were just ridiculous in nature and really targeted and focused on the First Nations people and it almost seemed like it didn't almost seem it was it was racist and it was like we're going to attack your economy in some instances and that was like you know was not w well received at all and and the reaction is really positive we're getting a lot of positive reactions mm -hmm. uh, across the board in First Nation countries yeah you know it's like Every First Nation in Canada, you always have something really positive that's coming out of this reaction. The thing is, this positive reaction is to a minimum of what the government should be doing. Mm -hmm. Like, this is great, it's all fantastic, and my hat's off to Trudeau and, and his team for doing this, but this is just the beginning. It's the beginning. This is yeah. like 
okay, for so long you haven't given us water. We're like <laughs> almost dead. Now you're giving us water. It's like, okay, but now there's a lot more. We, we need, you know, a lot mm -hmm. more things. But it's definitely a step in the right direction. But I've been following um, the uh, social media and looking at the reactions and not everybody's reacting positively. A lot mm -hmm. of people are saying, hey, these, uh, this is the enemy trying to play nice yeah and it's true that in fact uh, in history you know the canadian government and the provincial governments have been the enemy right that have trickled down you know little presents and little trinkets just to keep everybody happy and yeah. keep a lid on the pressure so i think even the skeptical people i think are right in the sense that let yeah it's good but let's keep an eye on them Right. I agree. And I think that uh, there's a, a genuine feeling there that there were some powerful words shared by uh, Justin Trudeau, the new Prime Minister of Canada, and his Liberal government. Uh, but don't go away. We're going to be right back after this quick commercial break. You're watching FNTV 360. This broadcast is brought to you by Solution Ford in Chateauguay. Proud to sponsor First Nations TV. Welcome back to FN TV 360, and we're uh, keeping on with the show, talking yeah. about all kinds of uh, interesting topics uh, related to First Nations. One of which uh, was the murder and missing women, but more particularly mm -hmm. uh, what the police are doing, the RCMP across Canada. Right. There, you know, it's interesting because you're you're starting, you know, with re in regards to this missing and murdered women cases, like over 1,200 across Canada. What a black eye for Canada! But I can see, definitely support Justin Trudeau and his efforts to, tr you know, finally launch this. There's a 40 million dollar price tag that's attached to this. Um, the inquiry is scheduled to launch uh, after January. Uh, 2016 but you know what I find interesting is the policing issues that are coming to the surface I think there was two or three years ago there was a you know um, a want for an inquiry into the RCMP where they do in their jobs there was a lot of allegations of misconduct with the RCMP and other policing services that were close to some of the indigenous communities here in Canada um, just more recent times I know that our uh, council here some of the chiefs at the Mohawk Council here went up to Val d'Or uh, you know yeah. to see what was going on up there if you can recall some of the that incident that yeah. happened with uh, CBC Radio Canada that broke a story about yeah well the thing know. is uh, they broke the story uh, they started the inquiry and now no news mm -hmm. very simple for them to sort of kill the story <clears throat> not accusing anybody of anything but I mean of course there's an inquiry going on but mm -hmm. there are certainly things that we should uh, be you know uh, informed about right. uh, what are the, the new procedures the yeah. and, yeah. have they changed their way of policing is there a better surveillance of the officers that are on the beat now mm -hmm. in, in the territory uh, because I mean let's face it uh, the issues related to uh, the missing and murdered women, indig indigenous women, uh, is is the same around the world. Mm -hmm. It's the symptoms of of a system that doesn't work well. the The people that are most vulnerable in communities are the women and the children. Mm -hmm. So when you start seeing that in any community anywhere in the world, that means something. Something is going really wrong. It's economics, it's it's systematic exclusion of society, it's education. Mm -hmm. You know, these are factors I'm pretty sure that are going to come out in the uh, in the inquiry. Mm -hmm. But they have to be looked at because it's it's fundamental to what's going on right now. Right. You know, one of the things too is that there's uh, some talk in the news lately about racism within the RCMP and a lot of allegations and questions like just how much some of these officers so to speak had to do with some of the women who are actually missing did they do their jobs were they involved and I mean you know I can understand why a previous government wouldn't want to open that can of worms but now it's there and people need to be held accountable uh, you know this this hits really close to home for myself and a lot of other women across the country who are indigenous but here in my own community there was a young woman who had gone missing several years ago the case remains unsolved I see her family all the time you know they're pretty present on Facebook wanting to um, you know uh, you know offering rewards to any information that can help to you know f find out 
who did it exactly. and I think that would go for any parent and you know just take away the the the, the card the race card at this point yes <clears throat> 1,200 cases of missing and murdered women in a, is in a country is despicable. But what if it was your daughter? Exactly. What if it was your child who never came home? Wouldn't you want to know what happened? So it's not just about indigenous women, but the fact is, is that there's 1,200 unsolved cases. It doesn't matter if some of them were tied to um, the sex trade or if some of them were runaways or foster care. That just tells us that we have a lot of things that are broken in this country that we need to deal with. The fact of the matter is that they were somebody's daughter, the sister, the mother, you know, and, and that's what really needs to be told is that story is not just about race. It's about being a human being and caring for people in our own country. Yeah, definitely. And and being a human being inside of a system. And the system we live in right now is very simple. It's a liberalist, uh, capitalist uh, uh, tendency or organization where the important thing is you got to make your own choices. Everybody starts from the same place and we all have mm -hmm. the same chances. Well, not criticizing liberalism, far from that, and not criticizing capitalism, far from that. Criticizing the people who use it as an excuse right. because it's not true that everybody starts at the same place and that's what needs to be looked at right mm -hmm. now. If you look at some of the remarks that are coming out of the AFN this week, um, the uh, Assembly of First Nations uh, Chief uh, Perry uh, Bellegarde said that, you know, him and the other thousand delegates are actually applauding the Liberal government's um, decision to launch the inquiry. They stood by their word. They're going to do it. And, you know, we're, I think we're going to hear lots more of this as things unfold in the next coming months. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, hats off. Uh, to this government because I know that uh, a lot of welcoming remarks on social media and throughout the, the press that people are, are feeling a sense of relief that it's finally underway. Yeah, the door is open. Let's uh, let's make sure that they keep the work <laughs> going and they achieve the uh, the objectives that everybody hopes that they will right. achieve. We could talk so much more mm -hmm. about these issues and more here on FNTV 360, but it is our first inaugural show, and uh, we welcome any feedback that you may have. If you have any ideas or even want to drop us a comment, you can do so. Reach out to us on FirstNationsTV.com or uh, what is your email address? <laughs> Sergio Pavone at <laughs> FirstNationsTV.com. Our Regan Jacobs at FirstNationsTV.com. We're willing to, uh, you know, we want to hear your feedback. And uh, thanks for staying with us. We are going to be back in a short hop, skip, and a jump, maybe a week yeah. or two. And uh, we hope you enjoyed the, the program. And uh, thanks for staying with us.